Today, I am excited to introduce you to a new friend, Kendall Vanderslice. Uh, she's an author of several books by Bread Alone. Uh, what's the one about feast? We will feast. We will feast. That sounds great. Obviously, she's about food. Uh, she has an online thing called Bake with the Bible. I wanted to talk about that. She's the founder of a nonprofit, a baker, as we said, a kindred spirit in so many ways, although she is younger, smarter, and a better baker. Kendall, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us here today on Living a Legacy Life. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll talk about legacy. Yeah, absolutely. So as you said, I am a baker, uh, a writer, and um, I run an organization called the Edible Theology Project. Um, so my my experience really started as, you know, I've always loved baking and wanted to go into a career as a baker. Um, and in my first kind of job in a professional kitchen, I would rush from work on Sunday morning to church and I would receive communion every week with bread dough still stuck on my arms. And I began <laughs> to question, what does this bread that I spend my whole morning baking have to do with this bread that I'm receiving at church every week? And so that was kind of the spark for all of the work that I do now. And, um, I just love it. I get to bake with people. I get to feed people and I get to, uh, explore all that God has to teach us through bread and through the table. Yeah. That's such, it's such a great, um, the whole thing about communion and meals with Jesus. You probably read that book and all the time, uh, that food is mentioned in scripture. I'm, I'm just glad that you're a theologian as well as a baker. <laughs> and I think it's great. I'm intrigued by the title, Edible Theology. How did you come up with that? Describe how it came about. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I, my background is in the field of food studies. Um, I did a degree in food studies at Boston University. And so many of my colleagues were talking about how they did edible history or edible anthropology, um, you know, that they were studying food, but also kind of how the process of eating changes the way we approach our field. And so I thought, wow, well, what I'm doing is edible theology. And, you know, theology is, it's the study of the things of God, but the, the word itself, Theo and Logos, it's all about the study of the word with a capital W, God as word, and also, you know, the study of the words that God gives to us. Um, and so edible theology is this way that I believe God speaks to us through the act of baking and through eating, that it's, we're studying the ways that food is present in scripture, but also we're allowing God to speak to us through the process of cooking and eating together. Um, mm -hmm. And so I love the sort of richness that's at play in the relationship between the edible and the theology. My sister, my older sister, years ago, um, pegged me as someone who studied the theology of hospitality. So I kind of get where you're coming from. And I just think it's so rich. Um, edible theology is designed to help us tell better stories, define better story. I'm a storyteller by nature. I've been told that anyway. And, um, and some people are better at it than others as far as telling them or listening. But what do you mean by um, being able to tell us better stories? You know, I think so often we the stories that we tell about who we are and where we come from, um, the ways that our communities have shaped our lives, they tend to be somewhat anemic sometimes. We live in this sort of cultural moment where we're very online and we're tempted to flatten these narratives about the communities that raised us or the families that were that we grew up in or um, to flatten narratives around kind of other, other people that we may encounter. Um, and so oftentimes the stories that we tell are lacking in so much um, richness. We like to try and, and simplify narratives and see things as black and white, see things as, you know, cut and dry. Um, and I think when we start by telling stories about food, it complicates the narrative necessarily. When we start by asking, you know, where did, where did this food come from? And who are all of the people whose hands were involved in the process of bringing this food to my table? And then who are the people that I share this food with? We start telling all kinds of stories about our relationship to family, our relationship to home, our relationship to church, our relationship to our neighborhood and the communities that we're a part of. And it, it helps us avoid sort of flattening narratives and, and trying to simplify kind of the stories of, of who we are and where we come from. And so why do um, you think people flatten? Why do you think people um, 
you don't want to take the risk to tell the real story behind this. It's, it can be scary to tell the story behind the story um, for, you know, it's vulnerable on our part to tell yes. a fuller story of who we are, but also it's easier. It feels easier to navigate the world when we feel like we can categorize people. When I can mm-hmm. say, this is the story of who my neighbor is. And this is why, you know, they are mean to me when I leave my trash can out too long, or this is why they never wave hello to me from their front porch. You know, when we can tell a flat story about who our neighbor is, it then becomes easier to not do the hard work of understanding where they're coming from, understanding, you know, what might have caused them to feel lonely or to feel, um, nervous around the person who lives next door of them. You know, it, it, it is tempting to try and flatten the narratives of the people that we encounter so that we can categorize them and sort of have to stop worrying about it. Um, Mm -hmm. it, it keeps us from having to see them as the complex image bearers of God that they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It takes work. It does. It takes work. It takes time. And sometimes I just don't feel like it. No, and, yeah. <laughs> uh, I have to ask God for grace. Also, I like asking him to help me see things from their point of view because sometimes I get very irritated with neighbors. And that yet that's my big thing is to call, you know, we're called to love our neighbor. And if we can't love our neighbor across the street, that's our Jerusalem. You know, we're yeah, talking about the absolutely. Great Commission. Um, I remember my mother saying when I interviewed her about hospitality that when she was raised in the Depression, and she was a pastor's kid, they didn't have company because they often didn't have enough food for their own family. Mm -hmm. And see, that is a huge vulnerability thing to say, something we would never say. I mean, I just went to the grocery store and spent $97 and it's just my husband and I. And, um, And it's easy and not everybody can do that. I realize even in this day and age, but the fact is that was a big reason not to have people over, at least in her mind or her mother's mind. Yeah. It could be an excuse, but still, that was a real thing during the Depression. And say, to hear my mom say that, that oh, you know, she overcame it. She broke yeah. the chain of ungrace, which is what we often need to do because we're all raised with imperfect parents. That Absolutely. phrase comes from Philip Yancey, by the way, to break something that we have been raised with for the sake of the gospel. Um, I'm all about the table and how God uses it. And uh, you say this about that. I'm going to quote you. In an increasingly lonely and polarized world. See, I talk about loneliness, but I don't talk about polarization. But obviously, especially in this election year, I just want to put my head in the couch. Um, Our souls are searching for places we feel known, valued, and loved. Well, I think we feel that way all the time, but we don't admit it. Sharing stories, yes, sharing meals can fill these gaps and foster connections unlike any other. Totally agree. And then you end with this, healing is possible around the table, pull up a chair. Now, I have seen this happen, Kendall. I I host wine nights, <laughs> which my mother, thankfully, she's in heaven. But um, as my sister says, she's there drinking the real stuff, the better stuff. But anyway, um, and it's not a Christian event. I invite all sorts of people. And the whole idea is so that women can commune with freedom and it's not the wine, it's the community. And it's mm-hmm. the questions that we ask. Can you share an example where this healing has occurred? Not necessarily at your table, maybe you've watched it at someone else's. Yeah, absolutely. So the um, one of the areas where I was just so gifted to get to observe healing was, um, I, I, as I said before, I did a degree in food studies at Boston University. And my um, thesis while I was in that program was I researched a church in the suburbs of Boston that held its entire service around the dinner table. They met every Thursday night around the dinner table. Wow. Um, and didn't, that they, was, they didn't meet on Sundays. They didn't meet on Sundays. They met on Thursdays cool. and they had their whole meal over the course of a dinner. Um, so they would open with a time of singing and prayer together. And then they would go through a buffet line and get their food. They'd sit down and there would be a scripture reading and sermon while they ate. And then it would end with three discussion prompts and the bulk of the service they had in conversation. And then they would close with a time of worship through singing um, and the kids would dance and then they would close with the cup. They would kind of open with the bread and close with the cups to sort of bookend the meal with the elements of communion. How did you and, find them? Um, I found them, a, the, it, the pastor was a friend of a friend. Um, she okay. knew that I was really interested in kind of 
meals, church meals. Um, and she said, I think you'd be really fascinated by this church. And so, um, I did my research. I just attended this church week after week doing ethnographic research. So, but, uh, the, the fun fed. term for that is sometimes mm-hmm. called deep hanging out. Basically you hang out with a community and you observe what's going on. And so I got to attend each week. I got to eat with them, talk with wow. them and see, see what's happening here. Wow. Um, but it it just so happened that this research was kind of taking place in the fall of 2016 and the spring of 2017. And so I wrote on this one church, but ended up connecting with a lot of other churches that were worshiping in the same way all across the country. Hmm. Churches from a variety of um, geographic locations, a variety of um, of ages, of socioeconomic backgrounds, um, people in kind of urban, suburban, and rural areas, um, and so it was this year of you know massive um, just social unrest and uh, massive polarization, increasingly apparent polarization within our churches. Hmm. And in that time, I got to visit so many churches that were practicing a different narrative that were, um, there was a lot of disagreement happening within these churches, but they were so committed to eating together week after week that it changed the way that they were disagreeing with one another and the kinds of relationships they were committed to. Hmm. Um, and so to get to, you know, navigate this year where I was hearing so many people sort of lament what they were seeing happen in the American church. I was getting to see so much hope playing out in the American church. And it was such a gift to get to sit at those tables and to hear the joys and the fears and the concerns of everyone who was gathered and to watch them disagree well together and Mm. hold to their commitment to love one another. Mm. Yeah, that was something, um, I thought of when I was reading up about you, I said, well, can't we just agree to disagree, which we can Mm -hmm. in love by God's grace, but some people just pull away because Mm -hmm. they don't like what they're hearing. Well, and I think what so often is at the root of it is that we want to be known and we want to know that our fears are respected by the people, um, that they're the people that we sit and eat with. And sometimes in our disagreement at the root of our disagreement is very real fear. Um, and when we are not able to trust that the people that we're disagreeing with love us deeply and seek our good and know that they also trust, we love them deeply and seek their good. And we might have different ideas about what it looks like to seek the good of one another. Right. Um, but we, we have to be able to trust that we love each other and seek one another's good for that disagreement for us to move forward in relationship with disagreement. But when we just are kind of hung up on the things we're afraid of and can't trust the other person we disagree with cares for us, it's hard to move forward in relationship. I'm wondering, yeah, I read that about uh, trust on, that was in one of your, probably one of your emails, but uh, my question was, and I wasn't going to ask it, but since we're talking about it, is how can we really know if we can trust someone? I mean, yeah, we might feel like we're trusting them and loving them enough to disagree, but the way we're being treated, we might say, well, I don't think I can trust them. So I can, I have to pull away. I mean, I think that's a very individual thing. I mean, I've had people leave our community and um, I don't even want to ask them why. I can kind of yeah. say it's why. And it's yeah. heartbreaking because I love them. I love them as my friends. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I mean, trust takes a lot of time. Time. And it takes a lot of vulnerability. And mm-hmm. I think there's sort of a cycle of trust and vulnerability that um, there has to be a certain amount of trust present for us to be able to show vulnerability. But then we have to be able to be vulnerable to share something more of ourselves, our fear or our need or our hunger or our longing. Right. But then when that vulnerability is shared, it gives the community an opportunity to then meet that hunger or that need or that fear or, or to celebrate that joy with us. And when that vulnerability is, is met with, you know, um, a fruitful response, it then deepens the layer of trust and allows us to then be a little bit more vulnerable. But this cycle takes time. It takes a lot of time to, to build trust, to be vulnerable, to build more trust, to be more vulnerable. 
and that trust can be broken so quickly. It takes Mm -hmm. a long time to build it and it takes very little time to break it down. And I think we can be easily misunderstood. Yeah, and, absolutely. And so rather than jump on the wagon of, oh, I can't believe you said that, to ask questions is, I wonder why you said that. And yeah. this is how it affected me. Um, I process out loud, so I'm always making mistakes with my mouth. But <laughs> um, I do know people who are not very in touch with their emotional intelligence. So this whole thing is something they're not even aware that they need, nor do they care. Uh, or, you know, they'd rather talk about something else. So um, I, I don't think we can force that, Kendall. I just see that in no. my old age that I go, oh, you know what? God loves them as much as he loves me. And he loves me a lot. So, yes. yeah. so to just just to be aware and not to have to handle people with kid gloves, but handle them with God's love. Yes. And uh, so I think this is a great discussion that could go on the whole time. But I want to talk more about this. Um, I don't think we talk about loneliness enough because of the shame involved. Yeah. Um, uh, you take it a, a step further and add cultural polarization. Explain how these two things are interlocking crises. Yeah. So loneliness is, I have just been really fascinated by um, research on kind of the physical effects of loneliness. Right. Um, so when we are lonely, our bodies and our brains go into this self-protective mode. Mm-hmm. Um, our bodies and brains are afraid that if we're in an emergency, there's not going to be anyone there to protect us or to help us. Um, so it's kind of an, a natural physiological response to loneliness that's born out of kind of, you know, early human, like when we did not have as established of institutions and communities around us, this real need to be on alert if you were alone. Um, And so our bodies respond in this way of like of self-protection when we get lonely. Um, And on a physical level, our bodies try to preserve preserve all our resources so that in the case of emergency, we can put all of our resources towards self-protection, which means that then there are physical results of long-term loneliness, this long-term loneliness. I believe the U S surgeon general has said it, it has a physical, um, toll equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That, wow. Uh, it's associated with higher risks of depression, of dementia, of heart disease. You know, our bodies are quite literally shutting <laughs> down when we're lonely because they're trying to preserve that energy in case of emergency. Mm. Um, but our brains go into self-protective mode as well. And we start to see any people or ideas that are different from us as a threat. Um, And so we see, you know, our bodies are shutting down, our brains are perceiving everything as a threat. And so our loneliness then puts us on high alert at all times. And that high alert kind of place of being um, is physically exhausting and mentally exhausting, but it also shuts us off from the very communities that could help address that loneliness and help get us out of that heightened sense of fear. Um, And so we're seeing kind of the ramifications of this culturally all over the place today, that this loneliness and this cultural political polarization are so deeply tied together and tied together with just this breakdown of trust that I think kind of began a handful of decades ago as, as kind of our rhythms of eating together and sharing our lives in sort of larger communities started to break down. Hmm. I was raised in a small church, like maybe 250 people. And it was my family and we had lots of potlucks. Yeah. And um, I think it made all the difference. Absolutely. And also my mom would, would invite any stranger over every Sunday. Yeah. Um, and I think that makes a difference too. I do recall one time when I thought everybody had left me uh, for evening church and left me alone. And I was sitting on the front porch and I was getting very nervous. I was a child. And then my parents showed up. They go, they were at a neighbor's house. And my mm-hmm. mom said to me, we would never leave you. But see, I had to, it's like you have to push against that. Oh, yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure you would never leave me. But think of the children being raised today who don't have the parents who show up later, mm-hmm. you know, who, who, who didn't make a mistake. Uh, they actually just left. Mm-hmm. And so of course their self-protection is this thick versus this thick. Absolutely. And, you, and to break through that, I think for those of us who are confident in God's love, not that we're always confident in God's love, but in the main that we are assured that there is life beyond today and that 
even though we're in crises, uh, things will good will come from it. You know, all these things we know in our yeah. heads and experience that it it's behooves us as God's children, as God's healthy children, as much as we are with God's grace, to reach out and be patient with mm -hmm. those who have those thick, they're like lizards. They have this Absolutely. thick skin. And uh, you just want to be gentle and poke them with the grace of God. You contend, <laughs> you contend this, that solutions to loneliness and isolation come from, I'm sorry, I'm so sick today. My throat sounds terrible, but, but we're going to make through this. We're going to make it through here and maybe I'll go have some homemade bread that you send me right after. This. <laughs> okay. You, oh, a question I didn't write down. I want to make sure I ask you is what is your favorite thing to bake? Oh, um, so I mean, I teach one particular type of bread that I call a sourdough on training wheels. Um, and that is my favorite. It's a, a long fermentation, very, very wet dough bread that is very easy to mix up, but it's so fun to play with. And you can do a ton of different things with the dough. Is that what you did with Beth Moore? It is. Yes. So fabulous. Um, anyway, what was I saying? Uh, you contend that uh, it helps. Solutions come from sharing stories. But why do you add the food element? I mean, we could just talk without food. We could. We could. Um, it wouldn't be as much I, fun for me. It's, but. it's not as much fun. Um, so, you know, from the very beginning of scripture, um, from the early chapters of Genesis, we see that humans were created with two basic needs. The need to draw nutrition and energy from food and the need to share our lives with other humans. Um, where so where do you see that in scripture? Uh, so from, you know, the, the beginning, the creation narrative, we have God creates all of the, the fruits of the trees and then places the human in the creation and commands them to tend to and care for this creation. Um, and so humanity is sustained by the very foods that they eat. Right. You know, we as humans could have been made like the trees where we have feet that could draw nutrients out of the soil or a skin that could convert energy from the sun. Um, but we were not given root systems and we were not given chlorophyll. We were given tongues with taste buds and we were given tables. Um, and the only thing that was not called good in this creation narrative was a human being alone. Right. Um, we were that. created to live in community with other humans and we were created with this need to eat. Um, and so these two needs are met at the same time when we eat with other people. Mm -hmm. And also this process of eating is a way of delighting in God's creation. And as a result, a way of delighting in God, we are delighting in the relationships that are shared around the table. We're delighting in the food that we eat, which is a continual reminder that we are mm -hmm. not individual autonomous creatures, that we require the work of gardeners and farmers and cooks and ants and bees and earthworms and microbes um, in order to exist at all. Um, and so it's this reminder of our reliance on others, but it's also mm -hmm. this deeply pleasurable and delightful experience. Um, but also the presence of food gives our bodies something to do in a way that makes conversation less fraught. Um, so if you are sitting in a circle of chairs where everybody is open to one another, it is much more intimidating to have conversation than if you're all at a table <laughs> and you have the actual barrier of the table between you providing right. a sense of protection and safety. <laughs> And then when you have a cup in your hands, it gives your body something to do, something to hold on to mm -hmm. so that you can then you feel a little bit mm. less vulnerable then because physically you have something to do. Mm. Um, but then there is a layer of vulnerability in the process of eating. It is vulnerable to put something into your mouth in front of people. We've all, you know, eaten and been afraid, like, do I have spinach on my teeth that nobody's yes. telling me about? Mm. Um, or you've eaten and you're nervous and you drop your fork or something, you know, we all, mm. there is vulnerability in the process of eating. And yet it's a shared vulnerability. We all enter into that vulnerable process together and somehow the presence of the table and, you know, the cup that we can hold on to provides safety as we venture into that vulnerable place. That safety concept, it makes me think of um, something when I, I encourage people to, when someone offers to bring something, I, I, I say, yeah, always say yes, mm -hmm. even if it's yeah. a cube of butter um, especially college students, they can bring a cube of butter yeah, and yeah. it saves you a trip to the store, but also for introverts, it gives them something in their hands yes. when they come in the door. Now, when I lived in Mexico and South America, of course, people would always bring flowers, but they don't always do it here. 
yeah. but uh, which is fine. Trader Joe's makes it easier. But um, the idea of when this introvert is afraid to come in and you had no idea they were afraid to come in. You were just yeah. inviting them because you're enjoying their company or you want to get to know them, but they don't feel that way. And we don't know what's going on in their mind that they had a bad conversation with their adult child right before they came in or they, their husband wants to leave them or whatever. Yeah. But they come in and they have in their hand maybe a store-bought loaf of bread from Trader Joe's, which is what they needed. It's like armor. Yeah. And they come in and then they gift you with that. And of course, I'm always delighted. So yeah. I just think that's a small way of saying what you're doing. And this helps yeah. me. What you just said helped me because I thought, well, what does food have to do with it? Because my husband would talk about his 94 Honda, but he would not have food stories <laughs> because he eats for fuel. Mm -hmm. You know, there's that, that person, that strange, weird person that eats for fuel instead of enjoyment. And I am married to one, which is probably good. So I bake less uh, <laughs> because otherwise I eat it all. Um, so anyway, that's great. Uh, you say this and I agree. There's nothing quite so isolating as being surrounded by people without feeling like anyone really knows you well. Uh, Kendall, have you experienced this, if you don't mind sharing? And what have you done about it? Yeah, yeah. I have, um, you know, I think we've all had these various experiences at, at various points. And so I, I feel like I can think of multiple times where I've been in that space where I thought, I want someone to know me, but to really know me. They can know the stories about me maybe, but do they yeah. really, really know me? Yeah. Um, I think in my line of work, it can be very easy because, you know, I've, I've written so much about myself in books or online. And so- I encounter people, even now at church, this can happen where yeah. I'm at church and I encounter people who they think they know me because they know all these stories about me and yet they don't really know me. And, and there's this sadness of, you know, this almost knowing so much about me keeps you from getting to actually really know me. Um, you, you aren't open to hearing the stories about how I'm doing today, mm -hmm. um, or what I'm struggling with right now, because it kind of breaks the mirage of, of what you think of who I am. Um, and that can be a deeply isolating, isolating thing. And I think that increasingly social media makes us more and more the reality for everybody, not just people who have a public presence. Um, how many of us have friends that we haven't reached out to in a while because we think we've got all the updates because they posted all the pictures of their kids or their grandkids on Facebook yeah. and Instagram. So we think we know what's going on, but we never pick up the phone and hear about the struggles in their marriage or the struggles in, you know, their relationship with their children or their grandchildren, that there's so much more that we keep ourselves from really hearing and listening to and knowing, um, because we don't want to, we don't want to break the simplistic narrative, that flattened narrative, like we were well, talking about. At well, the not only do we not want to break it, I, I don't think you and I would worry about telling somebody what's going on in our lives just because of who we are, but we don't have the time. Yeah. We don't have the time. And I, and also it's not always the time and place when yeah. you're in the church courtyard having coffee to tell someone how you really are. Yeah. But uh, we have a need to tell somebody. And so yeah. I would say, even as an extrovert, you know, and I have, I have, I've been accused by a dear friend I've had since sixth grade that I have too many friends because when <laughs> a crisis happens, I have to check back in with 24 people. <laughs> yes. I and resonate it, with that a lot. <laughs> I could tell kind of we would be dear neighbors <laughs> and always at each other's house, though I think I'd come to yours more. But um, I think it is a time factor. And I think yeah. that just behooves us as children of God to always be listening well to God because he'll say to me, Sue, this person will be okay, but this person over here needs to yeah. either hear your story or you need to hear theirs. And I will give you the strength to do it today. Mm, yeah. So it's really a, a matter of, you know, as he says, set your mind on things above, seek him first. Why seek him first? Because he knows the thermometer of our lives and he knows who who he wants to bless through ours, whether it be, um, I, I make bread all the time, but it's my bread machine because- I'm just that person, but, um, but who needs my loaf of bread mm, or my yeah. plum jam or who needs your time or a phone call or a text? I have found that when I felt lonely, I don't really feel like going out of my way mm -hmm. to do something about it, which only of course makes it worse. It's like depression. 
yeah. when you're a bit depressed, it just makes you more depressed to think about having to do something for yourself other than if you can afford, uh, you know, a massage or something. But if I put something on the calendar in advance, I remember giving that advice to uh, girls with broken hearts because I had been a girl with many broken hearts to say, okay, this week, I'm busy all week because I'm working full time, but this weekend I'm going to be particularly alone because I'm used to having a date. And so I, I, um, force myself to put Simi on the calendar Friday, Saturday, and Sunday if necessary. Yeah. Uh, so that because by the time Friday night comes, I don't want to do anything. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's just a practical bit of advice. What about you? Do you have think, some advice? Yeah. I think especially building rhythms of um, activities with other people is so important because especially as, you know, as a single person who lives alone, it can be really exhausting sometimes to feel like I'm the person who always have to initiate, you know, hanging out with someone. Like if I want to be with someone else, I have to initiate hanging out. There's no one built in that right. is naturally around. Um, and so I began to realize that that was a point of a lot of stress and pain and, and loneliness for me. Um, and so I started building rhythms with friends where we do have that built in sort of time together. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a friend who, whenever we're both in town, we do brunch together every Saturday. Uh, she and I both travel a lot for work, so it's not every week, but whenever we're both here, then, you know, we yeah. go back and forth between one another's houses. And we know that on Saturday morning, we have someone to have brunch with, um, or to have, you know, I have another friend who, uh, for several years, she lived just down the road. And so if one of us was going to Trader Joe's, which is on the other side of town, we would tell the other and say, what do you need from Trader Joe's? And something very simple like that, mm -hmm. um, of just being aware of how do we actually share the rhythms of our lives with someone else, recognize that we're not individual autonomous creatures, that we need others help. Um, it made us, and to know that there's someone else who's thinking of me in this very right. mundane action and someone that I'm thinking of in this mundane action um, was so transformative in my own experience of loneliness. So, so great. And I want to uh, add here that people can be just as lonely in a marriage. And mm -hmm. uh, because my husband is such an introvert, when people, when we were getting married, people go, oh, I can't believe you guys are incredibly opposite. And I thought it was fun at the time, but it's not always <laughs> fun in real life. Don't worry. It's 36 years in County, but, um, but for me to force him out of his introversion has been probably, um, a hard thing for him, but good for him. I always say it, that's good medicine, but of course who likes medicine and he's a doctor. So he would, <laughs> but, um, but of course me quieting myself down too in honor of him has been a great practice, but I think that people can, who is listening, who are listening today, most of my listeners are married. They'll be going, wait, I'm still lonely. And yeah. that's okay because in our solitude, God calls us to his breast uh, in ways. And also it makes us more, I think, sympathetic to others mm -hmm. uh, yeah. anytime we experience pain. Um, inviting people into our lives can be challenging. What is a baby step we can take to be able to move forward? Yeah, I think first is allowing yourself to... Um, have people into your house when it's not perfect, <laughs> but inviting someone into the imperfection of your house actually is a huge step of inviting them into knowing you more fully. Um, I think, you know, there is a gift. There are some people who have this incredible gift of hospitality, whose homes are perfect that are just, you know, they, they welcome people in and they have this amazing meal and they have candles lit and they have everything clean. And it, it is a gift to be welcomed into a house like that. But also sometimes that perfection can be a barrier to keep people from having to actually okay. know us or see the sort of simple messes of our daily lives. Mm -hmm. And also it's a barrier in that it prevents us from having people over because it's too much work to have people over. Mm -hmm. And so um, being open to having someone over when there's a laundry basket on your coffee table, you know, and letting them sit there and drink tea with you while you fold the laundry that simple things like that, that remind both you and the guest that we're both human who have a lot of things on our plate and yet we still need one another. Um, it opens up new sort of pockets of time for these relationships. And it also invites people to know you on a deeper level because they've, they've been allowed to see that, that you're human, <laughs> you know, that they don't have to just see the perfect hospitality side of you. Yeah. Well, this is my whole this is my whole mantra when I talk about invite anyway, hashtag invite anyway. I had a friend who would come 
over often after work and I would she would just walk in and say Sue should I put the kettle on and I would just leave my laundry for her yes. because she would uh -huh. actually do the folding and uh, so that that is a good friendship that and also we need to get over ourselves you it's do. really ourselves <laughs> that gets in the way of inviting someone into who, and someone said something about baseboards I thought I don't even know if I have baseboards so that obviously <laughs> does not bother me I did have one person I've seen her house and it was, it's a disaster but she came into my house once when my kids were little and she said, oh, good. I feel better about my house. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I think that was an insult. <laughs> but I'll take it as a compliment because I was a gift to her. Yes, I was a gift yes. to her that day. Yes. So if we see our, you know, this is true with all imperfection, not just our homes. But if we, if, when we're vulnerable, it's a gift to the other person because when they can feel, uh, then they can feel safe to pour out yes. what their needs are. And it's not like we're going to meet her. We, you and I and our baking is not going to meet someone's soul needs. Jesus yeah. is going to meet their soul needs, yeah. but they may not only meet Jesus at our tables with yeah. our bread, whether or not it's store-bought. Um, Mother Teresa said this, and I was, I, it's on my website because I think it's so important. She said that the most terrible poverty is loneliness and the feeling of being alone. And she knew the worst poverty. Mm -hmm. I mean, she worked with the worst mm -hmm. and yet she would say that. Mm -hmm. I, thought, wow, I mean, you know, we see this and we're in this moment of so much, there is so much wealth, there is so much ability to have things more than, you know, we can have more stuff in our homes and in our lives than at really any other point in human history. Right. Um, we have access to so much. And yet we have this, uh, this mental health crisis that is just decimating our every generation right now, but especially younger generations. And I think it shows that, you know, we can be rich in so many things, but when we are poor in relationships, um, when we don't, when, when we don't have the richness of the people that we share our lives with, it is devastating. Mm. You mentioned three things we can begin to do if feeling lonely. Can you share briefly? Yeah. So one I think is, um, just slowing down, uh, having to recognize that we can, that, that our lives are so busy. It prevents us from having time, as we said before, for other people. Um, and so slowing down and I think slowing down and, and getting into our bodies, having tangible practices that remind us that we are physical creatures created mm -hmm. in these human bodies that get to know God's world through our senses. Um, so for me, that's something like bread baking, but for other people, it might be knitting or gardening. Um, these, these practices that slow us down physically, but also slow down our minds and, um, and, and help us work inside of our bodies. Um, and then getting into rhythms of eating with others, um, sharing, opening our, our homes and our tables, um, whether that is, in our home or maybe in our church, or maybe it's, you know, meeting at a coffee shop. Um, you know, it might be sharing, you know, a cup of ramen with someone around your coffee table, if you don't have a, a dining table at the moment, but just getting into these rhythms of sharing meals and sharing, sharing the patterns of our lives with other people. Um, I don't remember what the third one is. <laughs> I don't either, but it was a good one. I, um, they can get that resource from you. There's a free resource. Yeah, it's the um, on on at edibletheology.com. Once you sign up for my email newsletter, you'll get this free yep. resource on right, what right. how we can help the loneliness crisis. And I love the whole idea of rhythms because once it's on the calendar, as I mentioned, it's like you can't argue with it. Yeah. Um, well, and, and you know, yeah. this is what has changed so much socially in the last few decades that the rhythms of having a church fellowship meal on Wednesday nights of going to church on Sunday morning. And then again on Sunday nights and, you know, having the dinner on the ground or the church potluck, those were the rhythms of our lives for many generations. Yeah. And now the rhythms of our lives are soccer practice and violin lessons and doing homework. And, you know, the, the rhythms of our lives have shifted and they've shifted to a more individualistic bent rather than this communal rhythm. Um, and we see the ramifications of that in all of these other ways that, that it has to be become cultural rhythm to really, to have a, a big change, but we can start with our individual rhythms of our lives. For those of um, my listeners who are interested in putting this more into practice in their church, could you explain the process of getting churches involved in eating around the table that you offer on your website? 
Yeah, so we have run up a program called Worship at the Table. Um, Worship at the Table is a six-week Sunday school and small group curriculum that um, really has two main purposes. First, it is a study of meals in scripture and in Christian tradition. Um, so looking at what does the Bible say about eating together? What is the story that God tells us through meals? Um, and also how have Christians practiced eating together throughout history? Um, but then the other goal and purpose of this program is to actually help churches identify how they can build rhythms of eating together into their church rhythms. Um, mm -hmm. So we bring you through sort of this practice of, identi of identifying the gifts and the limitations of your community. You know, are you a church that has an amazing fellowship hall with tables and you've got the dishes and you're, you've got the space to invite people in? Um, you know, you, you are equipped to to host particular kinds of meals and then identifying what are the limitations? Is it that people are too busy or is it that your congregation has declined and you just don't have enough people is, you know, what are the limitations and then how can you build rhythms that are appropriate for your community, taking stock of those gifts and limitations. Um, and so the goal is that by the end of the program, the group will, um, you know, over the six weeks of, of meeting, you're eating a meal through every lesson. And the goal is that by the last lesson, you'll be prepared to continue gathering as a church in some form mm. and eating together regularly. Mm. Our ladies group used to have uh, salad suppers mm -hmm. uh, once a quarter, I think. And I was leading a college girls uh, growth group. So I made sure we always met on Monday night. So I would just take the women, the girls there and I wouldn't make them bring anything I would bring the food for our, our group but it was fabulous and so simple yeah. because it was potluck yes and, and we would just have someone from the group give a testimony or whatever it wasn't a big massive things have to be so elaborate these days which is too bad because that keeps you from doing it it and does we, we brought back our Thanksgiving soup night this year our church have been has been through lots of changes because we're in three different locations so it's just more um what's the word is not laborious but it's just harder more complicated yeah, to get absolutely. everybody together so we had each location then do their own form of fellowship the Sunday before um before Thanksgiving and mm, people just stood up I and gave that. testimonies and we had way too many soups <laughs> and it was just like old times. It was like we were back in the old Baptist church. I always tell people soup, salad, and bread <laughs> is the way to go because, you know, it's easy. Soup and salad and bread are so easy, we but do. you can accommodate so many different food restrictions when exactly. you're serving soup and salad. And right. that is one of the really big barriers that people face is it's just hard to eat together to be aware of all of the different food restrictions, but right. you've got three soups. You can easily have a gluten-free and a dairy-free and a vegetarian and all of these different things accounted for. And it just makes it a lot easier to, and it's delicious. <laughs> and it's delicious and heartwarming. We um, have a great college group. We're in a college town. And so I invited our college pastor to bring his um, leadership team for dinner. I just thought it'd be more fun for them to eat in my home. And I said, Mark and I'll just go upstairs after I feed you. And he goes, okay. And then I said, so how many? I was thinking like eight. Uh huh. And he goes, 24. I go, okay, <laughs> okay 24. And are there any food allergies? Thinking maybe one gluten-free. Oh, yeah, very serious ones like dairy, gluten, egg. And uh -huh. I had to change my entire menu. But I've done it three times now. And oh, those kids, it. they love it. They come in all at once into the kitchen and say, can I help? I said, please get out. I'm not ready. <laughs> but um, they love they love being in a home. They yes. are godly young people and they're growing and I get to watch that. And I've just learned, you know, uh, tri-tip steak on a salad will work for just about anybody if I put the cheese on the side. Yeah. And um, and it's just such a blessing for me. So I want to encourage those listening. You go, well, I don't cook. Well, you have Costco and you have people who can help you financially yeah. as well. Um, I want to tell one other story too. Oh, we do a Thanksgiving, no, we do a Christmas Eve soup potluck, speaking of soups, because my husband's in a job that made him so he had to work at Christmas and it would be mm. depressing for me. So I started inviting these families over who also did not have immediate family over. This is a good thing for a single person as well. And you invite them over and they find out, you find out all these people who are not invited anywhere on Christmas Eve. Yeah. It's very yeah. sad. So we only had about 25 this year, but... Um, in the afternoon, I realized that one of my friend's family had COVID, so she was not bringing her famous chili, which she brings every year. So I thought, oh my gosh, I better throw a chili together. I had already made three soups 
And I said, well, I was too tired to put more meat on to go, or I could have used canned chicken or something. Ended up making a vegetarian chili. And I go, I wonder why I'm making this. And a friend who had never come before ate it because she said, oh, Sue, I'm on a, um, I'm, I'm fighting back on my diabetes. So I have wow. to have vegan food. And she liked it. I go, I can't even repeat it. I just threw it together. <laughs> so see, what I'm, my point is, is not I'm great, is that God led me and God will lead you those of you who are listening. Okay, I know we need to close off. Yes, I'm so sorry. I just realized okay. what time it was. <laughs> All right, we are going to be doing a giveaway of what's the name of the book? Uh, Buy Bread Alone. Buy Bread Alone. Thank you, Kendall. You've been amazing. And everybody can follow you at? Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at KNV Slice um, and on Twitter and Facebook at KV Slice. And your uh, website. Oh, and my website is kendallvanderslice.com and edibletheology.com. Thank you. Sorry we went so long. You've been delightful. <laughs> Absolutely. So good to be here with you, Sue. Thank you.